good evening all on behalf of indian society of hematology and blood transfusion i welcome all the delegates for today's 25th master class lecture on approach the patient with huge splenomegaly and without without wasting no further time i would like to invite the teacher and faculty for today's master class dr rahul naithani director and head hematology and bone marrow transplant paras hospitals gurugram over to you sir thank you uh, good evening everyone so today we are going to discuss about uh, how to approach a patient with massive uh, splenomegaly splenomegaly is a very common finding we all understand spleen is a vital organ at least in the early uh, ages and it reacts to a lot of things there is hardly any mbbs student who would not seen would not have seen a patient with a splenomegaly so today we are going to understand what spleen is what it does how it does and how do we approach a patient with a massive splenomegaly and we'll also come uh, to what defines a massive splenomegaly so first of all we'll talk about a little bit about the physiology of spleen so spleen is a reticulo endothelial organ i basically uh, in its embryonic phase it arrives at dorsal mesogastrium at fifth week gestation it arises in a series of hillocks which migrates left to towards the left upper quadrant which is the final position in an adult this is attached to the stomach via gastrolinal ligament and the spleen is attached to the kidney via a linorenal ligament now when these small hillocks fail to unify to form a single tissue mass accessory spleens uh, can come up and this has ramification while we are treating let us say a patient with itp and we do a splenectomy and we can see a recurrence of itp because of the accessory spleen being present now these accessory spleens are present in about 20% of patient the sizes may be variable spleen is part of a portal circulation and uh, we do not know why spleen should be in portal circulation however it is presumed that because of the lower blood pressures in the portal uh, system it allows less rapid flow uh, through the spleen it minimizes the damage to the normal erythrocytes blood flows into the spleen at a rate of 150 ml per minute through the splenic artery now this is a schema of the spleen now this is um, you know colored red but this is actually the white pulp and this is the red pulp spleen is broadly divided into two components the white pulp and the red pulp uh, this is the central artery and along the artery there is a primary uh, follicular area then there is a secondary follicular area surrounding these uh, areas there is a marginal zone around the follicles and then there is a t cell rich zone uh, which sheets the arterioles then there is a red pulp area red pulp area basically contains of these purple colored pulps uh, sinuses and this yellowish looking pulp cords these pulp cords are actually dead ends so once the blood goes there the cells cannot come out in case cells have to come out this is the inset of that uh, they can only sequester through the small sinuses that they have so only the fully functional uh, fresh rbcs can you know squeeze through these uh, sinuses and come back into the circulation the deformed old or you know damaged defective cells will not be able to traverse and that's how spleen does it the culling and pitting effects the red pulp is the site of blood filtration and it accounts for three fourths of the splenic volume the sinusoids are lined by reticulo endothelial macrophages sinusoids are tortuous their diameter is very small so these are very small these are tortuous the diameter is very small the cells actually have to navigate through it the rate of blood flow to through these is very slow it allows more time for the macrophages to phagocytose the foreign substances such as bacteria parasite etc as well as rbcs that have become damaged or are less able to deform or what have been opsonized by the antibodies the antibody coated platelets and wbcs are also removed from the circulation uh, through this red pulp contains aggregates of b and t lymphocytes and in situations where you have you know the immune hyperplasia in autoimmune disorders like autoimmune hemolytic anemia the spleen can become enlarged due to the expansion of these red pulp also the vascular engorgement due to hepatic diseases the back flows the cirrhosis and portal hypertension that can also cause congestive uh, splenic engorgement and enlargement so what are the functions of the spleen so in terms of the immune function basically spleen processes foreign antigens it makes bacteria and fungi more susceptible to phagocytosis it certainly does the filter functions where the macrophages capture the cellular and non cellular material from blood and plasma including bacteria culling effect is very important removal of the effect effect basically means the inefficient uh, cells 
the old degenerated senescent platelets and red blood cells the pitting uh, the removal of inclusions from the rbcs and returning repaired cells into the circulation and that's how sometimes in peripheral fluid we should pitted rbcs pooling spleen is a major resource uh, 30 to 40% of platelets are sequestered within the spleen and a large number of neutrophil pool is also available within the spleen and this is the reason that we see post splenectomy thrombocytosis or uh, leukocytosis in these patients iron reutilization removal of iron from ingested degraded hemoglobin during the red cell culling and then return the iron to the plasma so broadly quality control of the red blood cells the immune functions the filter functions and iron reutilization now any of the exaggeration of these normal physiological functions can lead to splenomegaly so this is important to understand the physiology so that once we have a patient with splenomegaly we can you know tailor our investigations or approach accordingly now how do we approach a patient with splenomegaly and before i talk about patient with splenomegaly what actually constitutes splenomegaly so if we compare palpation percussion with ultrasound we see that the sensitivity of palpation is 56 to 71% in different studies and percussion is 59 to 82% but again you know if 100 patients have splenomegaly with ultrasound palpation and percussion are going to miss a lot and also the reproducibility amongst examiner is not very good for a uh, percussion so both the techniques are less reliable in obese patient or patients who have just eaten so to say if you really suspect splenomegaly physical examination at best is imprecise of course larger spleens you are able to palpate with much also the spleen needs to significantly enlarge in size so it is said spleen needs to be more than double the size before we can say that someone has a splenomegaly because spleen tends to first enlarge you know uh, posteriorly and once that space is full then only comes out anteriorly below the rib so if we talk about the spleen size what is a normal spleen size so if you look at the uh, bone marrow transplant healthy donors between 18 to 55 1230 patient and the median spleen length was about 11 cm the median volume was about 160 a normal spleen rarely weighs more than 250 g however the size of spleen you know increases with height and weight and the size of spleen decreases with age so the upper limits for tallest females and males are about 12.3 and 14.5 cm the majority of the radiology centers um, across world take upper limit of 12 cm so somebody with 12.3 or 14.5 cm will be labeled as splenomegaly in the report however this will you know uh, inadvertently classify 6% of female and 26% of males as having splenomegaly while that spleen may be normal for their age and weight and height actually now spleen which is palpable is a major physical sign and it is generally a sign that somebody may be having a disease once we have taken into account the normal 6% females and you know about 20% males could have a spleen radiological splenomegaly Now, splenomegaly may be a part of the primary disease. Splenomegaly may also be a reflection reaction to the primary. So, if we were to, you know, in in older times in Hodgkin's lymphoma, splenectomies were done for staging, and only two uh, one third of patient had Hodgkin's lymphoma. Two thirds of the splenomegaly were reactive in these. So, splenomegaly may not necessarily mean the primary site of illness. Now, if you talk about palpable spleen uh, in three percent of two thousand two hundred asymptomatic males, fresh college student. a uh, 3% patients had splenomegaly which was asymptomatic in 3 years follow up at least 30% of these uh, students continued to have palpable spleen and a 10 year follow up of these asymptomatic patients said that there no evolution into a lymphoid malignancy so just having a spleen enlargement may not necessarily be a sign of an illness now how do we grade splenomegaly clinically we say mild splenomegaly if spleen is up to 4 cm we say moderate splenomegaly if it is 4 to 8 cm massive splenomegaly has traditionally been uh, uh, defined as spleen which is palpable 8 cm below the left costal margin or if its drainage weight is about 1000 g uh, you will remember the normal weight was about 160 and normal spleen rarely weighs more than 250 g so massive splenomegaly is graded when it's you know about 1 kg and above when a patient clinically has a massive splenomegaly then the, which is the topic for today the differential diagnosis is actually far more narrower mild splenomegaly moderate splenomegaly there are several causes now what are the causes of splenomegaly if you remember from the previous slide the functions of the spleen and any of the exaggerated function could lead to splenomegaly so the common causes of splenomegaly and here i'm not talking about massive splenomegaly at this point of time just splenomegaly so infections cellular proliferation congestive splenomegaly uh, because of some infiltration 
or some infarction and injury these are the five common subsets and the heads under which the cause of splenomegaly would fall into so if i have to talk about the reticular uh, endothelial system remember the spleen is a reticular endothelial organ and if there is a reticular endothelial system hyperplasia either because of hereditary spherocytosis uh, early sickle cell anemia hereditary ovalocytosis thalassemia major other hemoglobinopathies paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria especially the hemolytic variant and pernicious anemia these patients can have uh, splenomegaly if i talk about immune hyperplasia as a mechanism which is generally response to an infection which could be a bacterial fungal viral or parasitic infectious mononucleosis is one of the very common causes of splenomegaly uh, aids hepatitis cmv subacute bacterial endocarditis septicemia syphilis splenic abscess tuberculosis histoplasmosis very common cause in india malaria kala azar and then uh, in western world trypanosomiasis and ehrlichiosis if you talk about disorder immune regulation so hemophagocytic lymphocytosis you can have arthritis feltis syndrome you understand is a triad of neutropenia splenomegaly and arthritis collagen vascular diseases serum sickness uh, immune hemolytic anemia is a very common cause of splenomegaly immune thrombocytopenia is generally not the primary but secondary immune thrombocytopenia and immune neutropenia is generally seen more in our children of course you could have drug reactions which could cause splenomegaly sarcoidosis thyrotoxicosis you could have angio immunoblastic lymphadenopathy now splenomegaly also happens in a situation of an extra medullary hematopoiesis where bone marrow is not functional so myelofibrosis we all would have seen uh, children with thalassemia major coming with uh, huge splenomegalies and then of course you can have a marrow damage because of toxins radiation strontium marrow infiltration by tumor leukemia gaucher's disease amyloidosis and here the spleen has an extra medullary hematopoiesis spleen is basically trying to make more blood because a uh, bone marrow is not able to make if we talk about this abnormal splenic flow so cirrhosis is a common cause hepatic vein obstruction portal vein obstruction cavernous transformation of the portal vein splenic vein obstruction splenic artery aneurysms uh, abroad hepatic cystosomiasis congestive cardiac failure uh, echinococcus and uh, portal hypertension so these uh, are the conditions which would lead to congestive uh, splenomegaly and again it's important to know so that when we talk about approach to splenomegaly we look at these histories uh, carefully and then tailor our approach accordingly when we talk about the infiltrative disorders so you can have an amyloid gaucher's neiman pick stenges majority of the you know the pediatric metabolic disorders the hurler syndrome hyperlipidemia majority of them will come in infancy early infancy actually then benign and malignant cellular infiltrations we all understand leukemia lymphoma hodgkin's lymphoma they cause splenomegaly then polycythemia vera essential thrombocytosis myelofibrosis which is again a myeloproliferative disorder comes with a splenomegaly patients could have angiosarcomas metastatic tumors eosinophilic granuloma now the malignant causes of splenomegaly if you look at the entire you know indian uh, uh, community and splenomegaly malignancy is going to be a very small component uh, uh, amongst the overall causes of splenomegaly then one could have of course a hemangioma splenic cyst there are some unknown etiologies and uh, frankly uh, no one can enumerate the causes of splenomegaly i think each and every one of you will have a patient uh, with a uh, entity which is not listed in this and this patient would have presented with splenomegaly which may have resolved over a 6 uh, uh, to 12 weeks time so iron deficiency anemia especially in children 15% can have splenomegaly severe vitamin b12 deficiency sometimes uh, comes with splenomegaly and then of course there can be an idiopathic splenomegaly now we'll come to our topic which was for today a uh, massive splenomegaly so as we remember the massive splenomegaly is defined as spleen which is more than 8 cm below the costal margin or weighs more than 1 kg the 10 textbook causes of massive splenomegaly are chronic myeloid leukemia lymphomas hairy cell leukemia myelofibrosis polycythemia vera so if you see majority of them are all malignancy side chronic lymphocytic leukemia then there could be gaucher's disease sarcoidosis especially the multisystemic sarcoid a diffuse splenic hemangiomatosis and autoimmune hemolytic anemia now all these conditions will not necessarily present with massive splenomegaly they can present with a no spleen spleen of 1 cm 5 cm or 10 cm however among patients presenting with massive splenomegaly these 10 are the common textbook differentials now majority of you will wonder that you know you would have seen massive splenomegaly apart from this fairly common in your clinical practice and that's correct that is also because you know in lot of diseases the spleen were not supposed to be this large but because of the natural history uh, diagnosis not made or treatment not made many patients with other conditions do present in our clinics with massive splenomegaly 
So in India, it's common to see patients with kala azar, tropical splenomegaly, thalassemia major who have not been, you know, adequately transfused. Patients with disseminated tuberculosis and chronic liver disease with portal hypertension, they do come with uh, massive splenomegaly. Apart from that, there will be several other anecdotes with, you know, uh, massive splenomegaly coming in our pregnancy. And uh, like we say, tuberculosis could cause anything except pregnancy. Similarly, we should not discount HIV and sometimes HIV can come with a large spleen. Now, how do we, uh, what, what is it that we should ask the patient in terms of history? Again, remember the functions of the spleen, whether the reticular endothelial hyperphasia, whether it's the immune mechanism, whether it is a con congestive uh, mechanism. So what are the symptoms of splenomegaly? Generally, spleen will give you a dragging sensation. So um, most of the times it's not actually pain. It's a heavy dragging sensation in the left upper quadrant or just, you know, patient feels that there, there was a hard feeling on my left upper quadrant. Uh, a larger spleen because it impinges on the stomach can cause early satiety. Now, vascular occlusion because of any cause, sometimes myeloproliferation, sometimes obstructive disorders and uh, fairly commonly seen in children and younger ages, it can cause infarction and once spleen is infarcted, it can cause significant pain. Rupture of the spleen either from trauma or infiltration that breaks the capsule can cause intraperitoneal bleeding, shock and death. Again, one of the rare presentations, but uh, the audience who is more aligned towards the surgical side would have seen a lot of traumatic splenomegalies. Now, can symptoms point toward a diagnosis? Yes. So if somebody is also complaining of fatigue, this patient may be having a low hemoglobin. If somebody is coming with fever along with splenomegaly, so again, splenomegaly with anemia can have a different set of differentials. Fever with splenomegaly can have a different set of differentials. Here we are looking at infections, malignancies, SLEs or other similar autoimmune disorder. Patients with bony pain. Bony pain is a very you know, important marker of marrow infiltration and this could be because of the leukemia. Similarly, there may be infiltration, stretching of actually the splenic capsule, which would be causing a splenic infarct. Then patients can, with portal hypertension can, can present with hematemesis. Also patients with severe thrombocytopenia, either primary or secondary, may come with hematemesis. So these are the pointers, which can, these are the historical findings where one could think of whether we are looking at a uh, underlying diagnosis. Of course, personal history of alcohol intake for somebody presenting with chronic liver disease, family history of Gotcher's disease is useful. And uh, residential uh, history is very important. The patients with Kalas are is endemic in certain areas. Chronic malaria is, you know, endemic in a lot of areas in India. So uh, that residence information also helps us. Now, what do we look at uh, examination? So again, like we had fever with splenomegaly, anemia with splenomegaly. In clinical examination, we can see that patients have pallor. Patients can have lymph node enlargement. Again, the commonest cause for lymph node enlargement are not going to be malignancy but infectious mononucleosis, tuberculosis, and other causes. However, lymphoma and leukemia should be kept in mind. A size of splenomegaly is very important. As we said, you know, enteric fever will come with, you know, tipped palpable, maybe a little bit of more of splenomegaly. However, massive splenomegaly, the differential diagnosis is significantly narrow. Does this patient has a hemolytic facies? So we all know patients with thalassemia major with hemolytic facies can call. Uh, in pediatrics, there's also other entity where the, you know, the child would look like exactly thalassemia, it's just that the HPLC is normal. This entity is called CDA or congenital dyserythropoietic anemia. Again, there's an extra medullary hematopoiesis happening because marrow has dyserythropoiesis, spleen is enlarged. These children typically look like a thalassemia child, but a bone marrow is diagnostic in these. Of course, you look at the signs of uveitis, which could be there in sarcoidosis, SLE. Uh, you know, uh, conventional teaching in sarcoidosis, you will examine the shins for, sh uh, for, uh, for nodes there. And then ascites will be a finding of cirrhosis, SLEs, lymphomas. And one should also look for signs of chronic liver failure, like ascites, spider nevi, etc. Uh, lab assessment, once we have looked at the size of splenomegaly and kind of made a differential diagnosis for this patient, the lab assessment is rather straightforward. I think the two single most important uh, tests for this is a complete hemogram and ultrasound abdomen. Rest all investigations are tailored as per your history and examination. Suppose this was an alcoholic, you are looking for more of a chronic liver disease kind of side, you are going to test there. If you are thinking of Kala Azar, your testing is going on that direction. If you are thinking of chronic malaria or if complete hemogram is saying leukemia, lymphoma or such finding, then you are headed there. But the two basic investigations are ultrasound abdomen and complete hemogram. Now, when we are looking at uh, imaging of the abdomen, we should realize that ultrasound is a very good modality for measuring the size of the spleen. However, if there is a situation where we are, we, I'll come to one of the cases where we need to look at the, you know, anatomy or the structure of the spleen, then CT and MRI are superior to ultrasound. But in common clinical practices, ultrasound abdomen is a good enough finding. 
Now, when we look at the lab assessment, the hemoglobin and the RBC counts may be de decreased in a patient with splenomegaly, where they have thalassemia major syndrome, they have SCLEs, they have cirrhosis with portal hypertension. The RBC count may be high in cases of polycythemia vera. The TLC or the granulocytes may be low in Felty syndrome, congestive splenomegaly because of hypersplenism and all, and leukemia. However, the uh, TLC and granulocyte may be increased in cases of infection. Uh, inflammatory disorders, very important sign. You have a patient with you know, uh, fever, splenomegaly pain, platelets high, you look at autoimmune, platelets low, probably on the leukemia or lymphoma part. Myeloproliferative disorders would come with you know, high TLC, high platelet, high hemoglobin, and a splenomegaly. Now, similarly, platelet count may be reduced. If there's an enhanced sequestration, spleen is very big, hypersplenism, destruction of platelet, congestive splenomegaly, and immune thrombocytopenia. Now, immune thrombocytopenia, primary ITP generally does not have splenomegaly. It is the secondary immune thrombocytopenia because of uh, SLE, CLL, or some infection where uh, you may have a uh, splenomegaly. Now, platelet count will be high in cases of myeloproliferative disorder. So once you have a spleen site, you have an adequate history and you have a CBC, uh, much of the path for the splenomegaly, at least for the massive splenomegaly, is set. Now, the CBCs may reveal cytopenia on two or three cell lines, which is called hypersplenism, which is basically a splenomegaly, cytopenia, normal or hyper, hyperplastic bone marrow. And generally, this responds to splenectomy. Now, increased reticulocyte production index is, is generally less because once the spleen is bigger, it is eating away the reticulocytes also. So, the reticulocyte rise may not be uh, that appropriate. Now, we have understood what to take in history, what to look for, you know, in clinical examination. And once we have zeroed into the, you know, uh, the differential diagnosis, then I'll just share some uh, clinical cases of massive splenomegaly because that was the topic assigned. And uh, listen carefully. So this is a 56-year-old male who presents with four months history of recurrent fevers. He had pallor, he had abdominal distension. And generally, uh, in a lot of our situations, abdominal distension basically means hepatosplenomegaly. This patient had received multiple blood and platelet transfusions outside. When we examined this patient, he had multiple enlarged lymph nodes. He had massive hepatosplenomegaly. Now, for somebody coming with this history and multiple transfusions, lymph node, I would actually also think of a leukemia or lymphoma. However, the spleen was very big. We know once spleen is, you know, beyond umbilicus, with lymph node, fever, four-month history, multiple transfusion requirement, you're probably looking at a primary, you know, marrow or reticular endothelial disorder kind of thing. We do the CBC and this is the finding. And I'll just spend some time here, uh, at least for the students. I see a lot of students have logged in for uh, today's session. So in this report, you see the hemoglobin is low, platelets are very low, and I do not see white blood cell count anywhere. Whenever you do not see WBC total count, always look at the differential and you see something called corrected TLC. The moment you see corrected TLC, this patient for sure has NRBCs because TLC has been corrected for NRBCs. So in this patient, the TLC is 19.4. You have 40 nucleated red blood cells. You have myelocytes, you have metamyelocytes. Whenever you have myelocyte and metamyelocytes in the CBC differential, this is called a left shift. Whenever you have a nucleated red, red blood cell, it is called the left shift of the erythros erythroid series. Whenever you have both left series in the erythroid and myeloid, this is called a leukoerythroblastic blood picture. Leukoerythroblastic blood picture is an absolute indication to do a bone marrow unless the patient has a severe vitamin B12 deficiency because this could present like that. So B12 levels are normal, absolute indication to do a bone marrow. And once you do bone marrow, you see that the bone marrow is, you know, fibrous. This patient has a primary myelofibrosis that explains his low-grade fever, that explains his hepatomegaly, splenomegaly, and lymph node because they are all sites of extramedullary hematopoiesis that also explains massive splenomegaly and multiple blood and platelet transfusion requirement. So again, once you have a large spleen size and once you have looked at the CBC, you kind of, uh, you know, have a direction where you are headed. Now, this is an 18-year-old male who presents with a short febrile illness, two weeks, weakness, received two units of blood transfusions outside, has generalized lymph node enlargement. How do we define generalized lymph node enlargement? Whenever a patient has um, uh, lymph node enlargement at three anatomical sites, it's called generalized lymph node enlargement. So this patient has cervical, axillary, inguinal lymph node enlargement. Spleen was palpable 9 centimeters below the costal margin. Again, short febrile illness, large spleen, lymph node, requiring a blood transfusion. Most likely we are dealing with a primary reticular endothelial marrow disorder kind of thing. CBC is an important finding. And so this is a young male, 18 years, 
So again, hemoglobin is low. TLC is very high. We are looking at some myeloproliferation. Platelets are very low, but differential diagnosis in itself gives me a diagnosis. This child has has ninety four percent blast. So here we are dealing with a case of pre B acute lymphoblastic leukemia, which was the final diagnosis. I have taken away all the details because the idea was, you know, the approach towards splenomegaly. This is another patient. Uh, this is about sixty years, uh, probably male. Uh, she had fever in March twenty three. CBC showed pan cytopenia at that point of time. A CT abdomen was done outside, which showed ascites, peritoneal thickening. Spleen was twenty two centimeter, and uh, endoscopic ultrasound guided FNAC was done from the abdominal node, which showed lymphoid proliferation. AFP was positive. This patient was started on ATT. He had a significant clinical improvement. The fever improved. Patient felt better, gained a lot of weight uh, post treatment. Ascites reduced to minimal now, which was massive at that point of time. However, his cytopenias were persisting, and this is when he presented to us uh, in June itself. And when we did his CBC again, so you know the spleen was twenty two centimeter. This so massive splenomegaly was eight centimeter below the costal margin, which is a clinical splenomegaly. However, you add eight to radiological twelve centimeter, so twenty. Centimeter and above is kind of massive splenomegaly. So this patient is presenting with massive splenomegaly again. As we said in India, tuberculosis is a common cause of massive splenomegaly. So our differential diagnosis was very narrow. However, here the TLC was thirteen point five at this point of time. The the cytopenia part, the TLC had started to go up. This patient is still pan cytopenic because absolute uh, neutrophil count is very low. Neutrophil were only five percent. CBC showed eighty percent atypical cells. Reticulocyte count was one point eight. the patient also had folate deficiency then other parameters were more or less normal his direct coombs test serum protein lactoferrosis viral markers because of ag dissociation they were done they were negative so we have a patient with massive splenomegaly who had definite tuberculosis but post treatment a portion of his health improved a portion of his health continued to be same at this point of time a primary you know lymphoreticular malignancy was suspected because of atypical cells a pet ct was done also to see the response to previous tuberculosis and we saw that the mediastinal load has significantly reduced the uh, the much of the ct findings were you know reduced however we we saw we saw new lesions in liver we saw increased mar activity and spleen in pet ct was 23.5 with an standardized uptake value of 6.5 basically an active spleen so we did a bone marrow for this patient this patient was uh, in presented to us last week only and in bone marrow again these are the cytopenias these were the peripheral blood the imprint smears were quasi cellular scattered abnormal lympho lymphoid cells large nuclei finely clumped chromatin abundant cytoplasm with hair like projections and whenever we are looking at a massive spleen megaly hair like projection if you remember the 10 classical textbook differential we are possibly looking at a diagnosis of a hairy cell leukemia or sometimes a splenic lymphoma or, or slvl splenic lymphoma with villous lymphocytes can also come however morphologically a smart pathologist should be able to differentiate between a villous lymphocyte versus a hairy projection of course all these still will remain a morphology diagnosis finally we do a flow cytometry to confirm and once we did a uh, flow cytometry this patient uh, was turned uh, out to be hairy cell leukemia so in all likelihood patient had hairy cell leukemia and tuberculosis both to begin with afp was positive tuberculosis was treated his health improved weight gained ascites reduced however hairy cell leukemia persisted So again, massive splenomegaly. A CBC can give give you a lot of clue. So I'm not talking about splenomegaly with CBC. I'm talking about massive splenomegaly with a CBC and someone who is you know looking at smear carefully. Now this is a 72 year old male. He presented with a weight loss of 10 kgs over last two years. Weakness, reduced appetite, and this weight loss and weakness has been you know, increasing over a recent time. His spleen was clinically nine centimeter below costal margin. We do a complete blood count. And we see a hemoglobin is ten, platelets are normal. However, the total white cell count is three lakh sixty five thousand. Majority of these cells were lymphocytes. The routine chemistries were kind of normal with some creatinine derangement. LDH was normal. Uh, this is the CBC of uh, this patient. I am not sure if this is projecting clear uh, in my screen. It is blurred. I'll just read it out for you. So the hemoglobin for this seventy two year old gentleman is ten point one. TLC is three sixty five. Neutrophils start three percent, but absolute neutrophil count is normal, so this is not neutropenic. However, they were ninety-three percent lymphocytes. So majority of the cells are lymphocytes, and the peripheral smear showed smudge cells. And whenever PS is showing smudge cell, we are looking at a diagnosis of a chronic lymphocytic leukemia. 
again in today's time at least in advanced center it is uncommon to see patients with CLL with such a large splenomegaly majority of the routine health check they will present lymphocytosis at dry stage 0 with uh, you know uh, lymphocytosis alone however this was a patient who was neglected again the usual excuses excuses uh, covid did not go to hospital and then had a splenomegaly anemia so presented with sorry binet stage c or dry stage 3 with deletion 13 q uh, this, I think a lot of you would have seen in your clinical practice. This is a fairly common illness in our country. So 39-year-old male presents with weight loss and abdominal fullness. Again, we see such situation in advanced centers are much less commonly. It is more common uh, scenario in probably peripheral centers or government hospitals or anywhere where a patient is not able to you know, reach a hematologist in a timely manner where delays because of financial, social, economic or lack of facility. The patient had a spleen which was enlarged 10 cm below costal margin. There's a young patient, so no com comorbidities. This was the CBC, and I I'll read out the original uh, CBC. The hemoglobin was 11.9. Platelets are normal, 345. The TLC was 1,96,000. Now, remember, the previous patient was 72 with TLC of 3,65,000. However, their predominant cells were lymphocytes. Here in this TLC, majority of cells are neutrophil, 64%. However, what I'm seeing is basophilia, isnophilia, myelocytes, metamyelocytes, 2% blood. This is a classical left shift and with basophilia and splenomegaly, my first differential diagnosis here is a chronic myeloproliferative disorder in all likelihood, chronic myeloid leukemia. And frankly, this is a comparative where we as you can see from January to February, majority of things have kind of normalized these abnormal cells. This patient has been obviously treated during this time. So we did a BCR ABL and it was a 90% so-called risk was high, basically chronic myeloid leukemia in chronic phase. So again, massive splenomegaly, less commonly seen in advanced centers these days, but again, a classical textbook case of massive splenomegaly. This probably uh, we should see, we should actually see less common because a lot of physicians, pediatricians and, you know, hematologists are very tuned to managing anemia. Uh, this was sad, this, this patient was actually flown from Kolkata to our center. Uh, anyway, this was a 25 year old lady. She had a short febrile illness, fever of two days dark colored urine for one day, was sick, hemoglobin was 2.4, TLC platelets were normal, she received two units of blood, she was admitted in ICU there, creatinine was 2.1, a G6PD was done, uh, checked in a female patient which was uh, low, the patient was actually labeled as a G6PD deficiency and, and after this blood transfusion when patient was a bit stable, patient was flown to Delhi for further management. On clinical examination was pale, spleen was 8 cm below costal margin. So we know, can this be G6PD deficiency? No, one female patient, now rarely female may have G6PD deficiency. However, splenomegaly is there. Splenomegaly rules out G6PD deficiency. G6PD deficiency is an intravascular hemolysis. And this is, splenomegaly is a feature of an extravascular hemolysis. So G6PD is actually clinically ruled out. Her hemoglobin was 5.1, MC was 122. Of course, we are looking at splenomegaly, short febrile illness, rapid drop in hemoglobin, dark colored urine, we are looking at extravascular hemolysis and probably it was overwhelmed. So now spilled into the intravascular reticular side count was 60%. So of course, G6PD is kind of out. We do a peripheral smear, which shows ferrocytosis, a direct Coombs test is four plus. She was diagnosed as autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Her workup also showed an underlying SLE. So this was an SLE which presented like uh, autoimmune hemolytic anemia and she responded to prednisolone a CR in four weeks. Now, again, remember in AIHA, and I'll, I'll talk about all data of AIHA also. So the textbook causes of uh, massive splenomegaly, again, we are talking about massive splenomegaly. These are the common conditions that we uh, encounter in our clinical practices. This was our very old publication from 2006 of autoimmune hemolytic anemia in adults. And I just wanted to, you know, kind of point towards the splenomegaly. Generally, the average spleen size in primary autoimmune hemolytic anemia was 4. And in secondary, the spleen size is actually smaller, 0.5 centimeter. However, the ranges were up to 18 centimeter, ranges were up to 16 centimeter. So, and more than 5 centimeters clinical uh, below costal margin, 11 patients had uh, in primary AIHA and 6 patients here had uh, in secondary AIHA. So, massive splenomegaly uh, does present in India with autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Uh, this is a case taken from internet. This is not my uh, real life case. But however, this is a situation where, you know, the patient is largely asymptomatic and splenomegaly was picked up, you know, either because CBC showed some anemia, thrombocytopenia or some portal hypertension or routine health check, you know, an ultrasound was done and somebody showed splenomegaly. So if you did an ultrasound, there was solid hyper mass 
have uh, complex ecogenic mass with cystic areas and of course a large screen here when you do ct non contrast is iso hyperdense and if you do contrast is homogeneous enhancement this is not my real life case the previous cases were real so this is taken from in internet just to understand the this patient actually has a splenic hemangiomatosis now splenic hemangiomatosis can be multiple diffuse uh, hemangiomas uh, across the body with spleen or just isolated splenic hemangiomas a um, large majority of them are asymptomatic and may not need any intervention however if an intervention is required then splenectomy is the uh, treatment of choice so whenever we are talking about splenomegaly we should always be cognizant of a something called hypersplenism and anybody in india any physician any medical practitioner uh, in india understands splenomegaly and understands hypersplenism now hypersplenism is basically a, you know a clinical conglomerate of a splenomegaly cytopenia a normal normal cellular bone marrow and it responds to splenectomy it's fairly common with patients even if the splenomegaly is because of hairy cell leukemia or myelofibrosis or chronic liver disease beyond the point that large spleen which was actually supposed to make more blood also acts as a double agent and kinds of do, does the sequestration or hypersplenism tropical splenomegaly again fairly common in india is an endemic country for malaria this is basically an exaggerated immune response to repeated malarial infection people present with massive splenomegaly they generally have high igm levels and about 40% 50% patients will have a reduction in spleen size over a 6 months period to uh, this so again history is important clinical examination is important the clinical background on which uh, this is being taken is very important now how do we treat splenomegaly it is very simple treat the primary cause if somebody had enteric fever treat enteric fever somebody had malaria treat malaria so when we talk about massive splenomegaly as we read the 10 common causes chronic myeloid leukemia in today's time it's, it's a curative condition people have normal life as any other patient any other person without cml <clears throat> so imatinib desatinib nilotinib bosotinib whatever one may want to offer chronic lymphocytic leukemia depending upon the genetics you treat with chemoimmunotherapies a btk inhibitors and uh, ibrutinib acalabrutinib or vcl2 inhibitors vinitoclax hairy cell leukemia cladramin still remains you know the treatment of choice lymphomas you know depending upon whether the dl pcl follicular lymphoma or a hodgkins lymphoma you treat with chemotherapy as per the type of lymphoma uh, and mind you all of these are potentially treatable so one does not actually need to treat the splenomegaly you treat the primary cause <clears throat> again if you have a tuberculosis malaria kalazar you do the specific therapy infectious mononucleosis and similar other illnesses hemangiomatosis if required uh, you do splenectomy myelofibrosis we give jacavi or rexolinitib or in younger patient or high risk myelofibrosis you do an allogenic bone marrow transplant if somebody has polycythemia vera routine phlebotomy is aspirin and cytoreduction when indicated splenomegaly generally will not go away with phlebotomy this is where you will have to add hydroxyurea to reduce the spleen size sarcoidosis again depending upon the you know which system is affected you do that and then steroids autoimmune hemolytic anemia you treat with steroids rituximab splenectomy depending upon the patient's requirement gotcher's disease um, if someone is able to you know afford this therapy or sometimes for this orphan drug you know this en enzyme therapy is available at some centers then you you basically use an enzyme replacement therapy so once you have treated the underlying condition usually splenomegaly will regress unless the splenomegaly had been there for a very long time and it is already fibrous where it cannot regress beyond a point the case in point is myelofibrosis now in case i have treated the primary condition and splenomegaly is still persisting and bothering me how is spleen going to bother me early satiety compression risk of trauma you know splenic rupture with trauma football player or some or road traffic accident uh, these are the you know uh, common thing or spleen can you know uh, bother me with hypersplenism so my hemoglobin may be, may be low my i may have neutropenia i may have thrombocytopenia so if i have to take care of the spleen part the simplest cleanest thing is splenectomy do you can do open you can do laps splenectomy nowadays robotic splenectomies are being done uh one can do total splenectomy one can do partial splenectomy in, in some situation of course there may be situations where patient is not fit and you know the the liver team the liver transplant teams they they are not very keen on splenectomy they generally try to do a splenic artery embolization in patients with you know but carry syndrome where post liver transplant the splenomegaly is still persisting one can do a splenic artery embolization and rarely patient may be unfit for both splenectomy and splenic artery embolization this we in hematology practice sometimes do probably you know once in 2 to 3 years we do a splenic radiation in patients basically to reduce the transfusion requirement so patients with myelofibrosis and best supportive care 
or any such illness where because of spleen their transfusion requirement is higher we do splenic radiation there about 5 to 10 grays you know uh, radiation and and it actually helps it it basically the hypersplenism kind of relapses about you know 10 to 18 months later but in palliative setting that is a good enough time but i am not suggesting to do artery embolization or radiation primarily it is splenectomy if spleen needs to be taken care of if spleen cannot be taken care of by primary treatment then we do splenectomy or splenic artery embolization or splenic radiation now when we talk about splenectomy before i finish up we should uh, remember that splenectomy is a definitive treatment for hereditary spherocytosis this can be the primary treatment for splenic lymphoma or the splenic marginal zone lymphoma and sometimes when you have splenic lymphoma and bone marrow you know uh, metastasis you just do the splenectomy and the marrow disease you know over a period of time and disappears so you don't need to treat this patient with chemotherapy this thing is called you know uh, abscopal trick that once you have hit the root the secondary changes which were happening kind of uh, regress this can also be sick splenectomy is also secondary treatment in hairy cell leukemia myelofibrosis pro lymphocytic leukemia to reduce the transfusion requirement or once the spleen is in a fibros beyond a point if you look at the surgical data and of course these are the older data they may not be relevant in today's time but if you look at the indications for splenectomy they were 10% diagnostic and many of them actually had a you know a splenic lymphoma it was therapeutic in 44% where the diagnosis is already established in older time staging for hodgkins uh, lymphoma in 20% and incidental to another procedure Some, sometimes somebody present with road traffic accident sometimes in lot of liver surgeries whipple procedures they need to take the spleen out now the only contraindication to splenectomy is the presence of marrow failure where the enlarged spleen may be the only source of hematopoietic tissue uh, we make an exception to this exception uh, is myelofibrosis where spleen was the only site which was supposed to make marrow but once spleen you know increases beyond the size then it also causes hypersplenism so the amount of blood it probably it was making it is going to eat away far more than that and this is where splenectomy or splenic embolization or splenic radiation may be useful but by and large if it's an uh, source of blood formation generally that's the relative contraindication for splenectomy and i think this is the probably the last slide the post splenectomy effects now we need to be cognizant that we all you know read about post splenectomy sepsis and all that majority of post splenectomy sepsis and mortality data is decades old two decades three decades old where splenectomies were done in very young children also and we know that till 5 years of age spleen has a significant you know uh, 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 role uh, in evolution of immune system till the age of 16 years that role you know reduces significantly and after 16 years a spleen uh, does not remain a major role in if we are doing a splenectomy in adult generally the post splenectomy issues are not that one so we need to you know uh, kind of delineate ourselves from our conventional textbook teaching that post splenectomy infection sepsis are very bad things much of the data is old in adults and nowadays it is rare for someone to do splenectomy in less than 5 years of age however so in all incomers the absence of spleen has minimal long term effects in the immediate post splenectomy period one can have leukocytosis thrombocytosis you remember the spleen pools the 30 to 40% of platelet and uh, and similar amount of granulocytes however once splenectomy is done within 2 to 3 weeks the counts times of regress sometimes this can take up to 6 weeks to 12 weeks in our clinical practice whenever we have seen post splenectomy patient by 2 weeks majority of these patients have kind of normalized their numbers chronic manifestations of splenectomy you know then spleen was doing lot of nuclear pitting and this this since this is not there. now spleen is not there so you can see in peripheral smear and isopoikilocytosis howell jolly bodies which are basically nuclear remnant you can see hens bodies which are basically the denatured hemoglobin you can see basophilic stippling and occasional anabasis once you have a history of splenectomy you don't need to react to these findings so pathologist would react uh, report this in uh, peripheral smear we don't need to react however someone who has an intact spleen and this finding is you know reported then we should investigate this patient that the spleen is structurally there functionally is not there so it's basically a functional asplenia or hypersplenemia hypersplenemia and we should investigate these uh, patients for that the splenectomy traditional risk increase susceptibility to bacterial infection and that is why you need to give pneumococcal vaccine meningococcal uh, vaccines to these patient h influenza b vaccine patients less than 20 years of age actually less than 16 years of age are particularly susceptible overall actual real risk was 7% in 10 years again majority of these patients were less than 5 years of age when these less than 5 years of age got infection then the case fatality rate was very high frankly in our early days of clinical practice anybody with splenectomy we used to write in you know in the discharge summary this patient has splenectomy if he reports to emergency with fever admit him even if he looks fine nowadays we are not doing that in fact lot of our surgeon colleagues who do splenectomies for you know the 
traumas and other things they do not vaccinate they do not give penicillin to fellas we being in hematology segment we do give vaccines now once you give vaccine you remember spleen is required to make that effect uh, to uh, to generate good immunogenicity you need an intact spleen so it's a good idea to vaccinate at least 2 weeks preferably 6 weeks but at least 2 weeks before a planned spleen exam once somebody is coming with trauma and all then you don't have an option then you uh, you know give vaccine whenever it's available uh again no hard and fast rules but in our clinical practice i am not saying this is right this is ideal or this is wrong this is what is our center's practice post clinectomy we give uh, oral penicillin prophylaxis for 2 years to all patients and we should also realize that no increased risk of viral infection so post clinectomy uh, is basically a capsulated organism risk no viral infections so with this quote that one should never argue with a fool because a fool will bring you down to his own level and then he has enough experience at that level and he will beat you with his experience thank you